historic week to affirm to the American people that hope is on the way. Vice President Pence among the first Americans to get a shot at the shot. The head of the White House Coronavirus Task Force rolling up his sleeve, vaccinated at the end of a historic year in which his administration downplayed the pandemic. Waiting for the green light, Moderna's COVID vaccine on deck to become the second to reach the American public. Nearly six million doses ready to ship. When they can first reach the arms of recipients, what makes this vaccine different from Pfizer's in the fight against the virus, and what we should all remember. We may lose hundreds of thousands of more people if we don't come together as a nation and all do the things that will work to, to turn this pandemic around. That joy, of course, comes with pain. The U.S. recording its deadliest week yet. Three straight days with more than 3,000 American lives lost. Matt Gutman reports from the urgent epicenter of Los Angeles, where the numbers simply don't tell the whole story. We'll see people pass away that shouldn't have had to die. And that will affect people with COVID and people without COVID. Late development tonight from Capitol Hill, where lawmakers say they're closing in on a stimulus deal to help millions of struggling Americans. But what's in it? And when can Americans desperate for answers expect that help is on the way? Even worse than feared, the fallout tonight after that major cyber attack. Lawmakers from both sides angry over lack of information and crickets tonight from the White House. And the effort to save struggling pubs across the pond is now going global. Why do you think Americans care about this pub? I just think it really struck a chord. I think it's a community effort. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us as we close out a week filled with both hope and heartbreak. I'm reminded of the old adage, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Those were the words of Benjamin Franklin in 1736. At the time, he was warning Philadelphia residents about taking fire safety precautions. Today, those words remain relevant for us for a different reason. All week long, we have seen that pound of cure in action as our health care heroes have bravely lined up to get Pfizer's vaccine. And today, our country's congressional leadership started getting their shots. President-elect Biden is set to receive a do dose on Monday. And yet we see the wisdom of that ounce of prevention as hospitals run out of space and the death toll spirals out of control. But tonight, some of the world's brightest minds have the U.S. on the verge of a second shot of much-needed hope in this pandemic. Tom Yamas leads us off. Tonight, the FDA expected to greenlight the Moderna vaccine at any moment, paving the way for the second vaccine against the coronavirus. I can tell you and your viewers that the FDA has communicated to Moderna that we expect to grant their emergency use authorization. An FDA panel finding the Moderna vaccine more than 94% effective in preventing symptomatic disease. Early data also suggests the vaccine may reduce asymptomatic infection in volunteers after one shot and could stop the spread of the virus. We likely will see shots in the arm by the very early part of next week. I would hope Monday or Tuesday. Moderna's vaccine would be given to people 18 and over in two doses, four weeks apart. Minor side effects include fever, fatigue, and headache. 5.9 million doses are now ready to ship as early as Sunday from McKesson distribution centers like this one in Mississippi. Our Gio Benitez is on the ground where the massive effort begins. And Moderna has a slight shipping advantage because just over the border here in Memphis is this, the FedEx World Hub, the largest cargo facility in North America where they can get those vaccines out right away. And unlike Pfizer's, Moderna's vaccine doesn't need ultra-cold storage and will be easier to get to rural communities. Less than a week into the vaccine rollout, debate over who gets the vaccine first. Healthcare heroes! Healthcare workers at Stanford Hospital in California protesting after doses of the vaccine went first to longtime doctors, some who have been working from home during the pandemic, instead of their junior frontline residents and fellows. The hospital CEO acknowledging it was wrong and vowing to correct it. Vice President Mike Pence today rolling up his sleeve at the White House today, along with his wife and the Surgeon General. Karen and I wanted to step forward and take this vaccine to assure the American people that while we cut red tape, 
We cut no corners. And now we're seeing more and more images like this. The vaccine reaching nursing homes with the help of Walgreens and CVS. Our Janae Norman in Connecticut seeing this part of the rollout up close. You receive this from FedEx. What will you continually use it for? So um, we will be continually using it for the long-term care facilities. And the rest of the vaccines that are in there, they will stay at the correct temperature until correct. you need them. Yep. The vaccine rollout, getting and giving those life-saving shots, moving even those who have seen it all in this pandemic. <laughs> it's a big deal for America, a big deal for the world. I'm very proud. Proud moment for so many. Tom Yamas joins us now. And Tom, of course, we're heading right into Christmas week, and some states say they were expecting more vaccine, but how much are we actually going to see roll out? Yeah, that's right, Lindsay. There was confusion, and some states have complained. Apparently, there was a problem with the way states ordered the vaccine online that led to some of the trouble. Operation Warp Speed says they are committed to delivering 20 million doses, and they say by next week, Christmas week, 8 million doses should go out. That's a combination of the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine together. Lindsay? Tom Yamas, thanks so much. Joining us now, former acting CDC director and former ABC News medical editor, Dr. Richard Besser. Thanks so much for coming back, Dr. B. So we are now on the verge of a second vaccine in as many weeks being sent across the country. Talk about the, the significance of the Moderna vaccine. Well, this is this is wonderful news. I was excited last week. I'm excited this week for, for a number of reasons. You know, the, the, the biggest is that we now have uh, another tool that, to get us to the end of this pandemic. It's not going to help us this winter, uh, but over the next number of months, it is going to change the trajectory of this of this pandemic. And it's a vaccine that has much easier distribution properties than the Pfizer vaccine. It doesn't need to be stored at minus 94 degrees, which will make it easier to get to some of those more remote uh, clinics, rural hospitals that, that need vaccine as well. You know, the other piece of this that excites me is I, I spent a lot of time watching the advisory committee hearing yesterday, and they asked tough questions. It was a normal process. So while this is the fastest we've ever seen a vaccine de developed for, for a new infectious agent, I don't believe corners were cut. Uh, I'm very comfortable recommending this vaccine. Even with these two vaccines now, is there a concern that we might run out of vaccines in the midst of this pandemic? Well, you know, it, it's not a matter of, of running out. There clearly is not enough vaccine to, to turn this around. Uh, it's going to be a number of months. And so, you know, the important thing right now is recognizing the, rec the, the recommendations from the CDC to, to vaccinate your, your health care workers, vaccinate those who are in long-term care facilities like nursing homes and those who, who work there. That's going to ensure our health care system stays, stays viable during this, this critical time and that the, the group that that has have the highest mortality rate, those in nursing homes, uh, gets vaccine uh, up front. Talk to us about the precautions that Americans still need to take even after they get the vaccine, because we still don't know if you can spread the virus once you've been vaccinated. Yeah, you know, whether you have had the vaccine or you haven't had the vaccine, you have to wear masks, you have to socially distance, you have to wash your hands. We are desperately waiting to see if Congress gives gives people the resources they need, uh, survival checks and survival uh, support to businesses so that they make it through this 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 pandemic. Uh, but we all have to think about the holidays, think about what we can do to ensure that that next holiday season, all of our loved ones there are to celebrate uh, are, are there to celebrate with us. At this particular moment in the here and now, you know, it'll still be many months until enough people are vaccinated to get herd immunity. What's your biggest concern right now when it comes to the pandemic? Well, my biggest concern is complacency, that people will will embrace the excitement of the moment. And I'm as excited as everybody, uh, but they'll embrace that and, and, and think that we no longer need to do those things that will save lives this winter. We may lose hundreds of thousands of more people if we don't come together as a nation and all do the things that will work to, to turn this pandemic around. That's wearing masks, keeping apart, washing our hands, and ensuring everyone has the resources they need to protect themselves, their families, and their communities. We can do this. Dr. Richard Besser, thanks as always. Thanks so much, Lindsay. And as we've mentioned, this week the U.S. lost more than 3,000 lives for three straight days with nearly 150 people testing positive every minute. 
And with the alarming surge all over the country, even greater concern that warnings will again be ignored and Christmas will cause even greater misery as tens of millions are still expected to travel. Matt Gutman has more. Tonight, ICUs at zero capacity across Southern California and gurneys and body bags marking the grimmest of milestones. The nation recording its deadliest week of the pandemic. And there will be more deaths. In the last week, there have been 1.5 million new cases and over 114,000 patients are in hospitals battling COVID-19, the most ever. And California is the epicenter, 190,000 cases just over the past four days. Hospitals bursting at the seams. You can see these medical field tents set up just to accommodate the influx. Mayor Eric Garcetti of Los Angeles, whose daughter just tested positive, warning that if hospitalizations continue to rise, medical facilities will go under. We'll see people pass away that shouldn't have had to die. And that will affect people with COVID and people without COVID. From Yonkers, New York, to this ICU in Reno, Nevada, brigades of medical staff fighting to keep intubated patients alive. With the White House Task Force now warning the current Thanksgiving-related spike will collide with another upcoming holiday travel surge. And outside McAllen, Texas, the virus infecting Billy Laredo, a beloved attorney, his condition worsening on Thanksgiving morning. He woke up and he said, Sonia, I'm having breathing problems. Right before being intubated and fearing the worst, he typed this note telling his wife of 21 years, we had our time and it was wonderful. I think he was trying to give me permission to be happy without him. Billy Laredo died this week. He was 45 years old. That final love letter to his wife. If that doesn't get you, I don't know what will. Matt Gutman joins us now from Los Angeles. Matt, as you reported, the mayor there is saying that hospitals could, quote, go under. He also said a, a countywide emergency order could be issued. What would that entail, and why do you think it hasn't been declared just yet? Right. The operative term there is could be issued, Lindsay. So he's getting a lot of pressure from the unions, teachers union, essential workers unions, things like that, to shut everything down. They need a strict lockdown. The question is enforcement. And I think this is why it hasn't actually been issued, that order so far, because life is still active here. People have been under some sort of closure or lockdown for nine months. And I think there's enormous resistance from restaurant owners, uh, businessmen and, and, and business people across this county um, to keep things open. They will not be able to sustain um, a livelihood or business after another closure. And people are telling me they're just going to defy it. The other issue is enforcement. How are they going to enforce shutting down tens of thousands of businesses. They need the sheriff to do that. They don't even have the manpower. So unclear how this is going to take effect this late in the pandemic, Lindsay. And also, can you give us a sense of the toll that these hospitalizations have been having on the medical teams that you've met? Uh, they've been forced to work such long hours and see just such dire misery. It is emotionally and physically taxing for all of them, um, whatever they do. And not everybody works with COVID patients or in a COVID ward, but there is always this overflow, right? People are still having heart attacks. They still are suffering from cancer. They still need surgery. They're having car wrecks, so they need treatment. Um, and those people have to be tended to, too. So what we're seeing is just nationwide burnout. And, you know, I've been talking to hospitals here in California. They are literally scouring the country for additional medical staff. They can't find any. And that's why the state of California is now starting to contract nurses from abroad to bring them here to help out. But getting them licensed is a bit of an obstacle as well. So it's very, very difficult. And these people are suffering. The medical staff in the U.S. are suffering both physically from exhaustion and mentally from just the, the emotional fatigue of dealing with so much for so long. And we're not even close. Still probably three, four, five months left of the pandemic at this pace, Lindsay. Wow. Okay. Matt Gutman, thanks so much as always. Thank you. As states continue to manage the ongoing outbreaks of COVID, they are also in the process of rolling out their supply of vaccines, with some realizing that they're not getting the amount of doses they'd originally planned for. One of those states is the state of Oregon. Joining us now is the health director for Oregon, Rachel Banks. Rachel, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Now, today, the Oregon Health Authority released its recommendations on who should receive the vaccine first. What are the groups you have prioritized, and do you trust that you'll be able to have all the resources necessary to get this vaccine distributed? distributed safely. 
Yeah, thank you. So the groups that we prioritized here in Oregon um, for 1A start with those workers who are in a hospital setting. So people who work uh, in hospitals, we've really categorized that broadly to include um, really our values of equity, which so it includes healthcare interpreters, traditional health workers. It includes those people who are cleaning rooms and those people who are delivering food. So our first priority is really that hospital setting. Uh, once again, all workers who work in that hospital setting. To answer the second part of the question, we don't think in this first um, tranche that we have enough to vaccinate all of those workers. And we know that um, it'll, it'll take longer than we, we'd like it to. Now, your state is also going to be receiving thousands fewer doses than originally told by the federal government. Do you know the reason behind the, the drop in supply? And should residents of Oregon be concerned or feel like they're getting the short end of the sick? The conversations that we've had um, for the reasoning really are about wanting to make sure that we have a steady supply and um, the, the federal government wanting to ensure that we have a consistent amount. So saving some of those doses at the beginning so that we can consistently vaccinate people, uh, which I think is important to ensure that we have the second doses that we need um, once we've begun vaccinating people. So are you saying you're still going to get the same amount? They're just not giving you as many on the front end? That's my understanding, yes. Okay. Now, during a Facebook Live event you held yesterday, you said that you had not received any information for shipments beyond December, and we're more than halfway through the month. How big of a concern is that for you, and are you getting the level of communication and support that's needed? I mean, we definitely want to have as much information uh, in advance as possible. That helps with planning, and it, it just helps us to understand how long um, it's going to take. Um, so I think, you know, we, we want to see those, those, that information um, as soon as it's available. Effective today, 29 counties are now under extreme risk. Now, you've said something that you're worried about is the level of hospitalizations. What kind of resources are you deploying at this point to help manage the overload hospitals are dealing with right now? Yeah, well, first, I just want to say thank you to Oregonians who have been masking, um, uh, who've been maintaining that distance, who modified their holiday plans and want to see that continue to happen. Um, some of what's been happening thus far is a reduction of elective surgeries and other procedures so that we can um, maintain, you know, hospital beds and the staff that go along with them. The other reason that we are prioritizing the hospital setting first to get vaccinated is to really uh, address the concern and what we've seen in terms of staff shortages. So we want to make sure that, that not only do we have the actual beds, uh, but we have the staff to staff those beds. So those are a couple of the strategies that we're using. And lastly, you've said before that advocating for health equity has been central to your career. The Pacific Islander community has certainly taken a big hit during this pandemic. What kind of efforts have you led to make sure that this community is reassured that the vaccine is safe and that they will be prioritized? Yeah, thank you for that question. I mean, there's a number of things. One is that we have been um, working with community engagement liaisons and community-based organizations, um, allocated 45 uh, millions to over 170 uh, community-based organizations that include organizations that serve and work with the Pacific Islander community. And we also know that we have to be um, having spokespeople out. We have to be listening to what the concerns are. Another strategy that we're using is a vaccine advisory committee. And that committee is going to be making decisions about the um, allocation moving forward. And so we have sought to have representation from the Pacific Islander community and other communities as well. And not just having that, you know, check the box, but that we really are going to be um, listening to what the needs are and um, making sure that we are giving all of the information that we have in ways that in, and languages that people understand. Rachel Banks, Health Director for the State of Oregon, our thanks to you. Thank you. And now to Washington, where one week before Christmas in Congress tonight is still working to hammer out a $900 billion COVID relief bill. At the same time, trying to avert a government shutdown. Congress voting on a two-day spending agreement to extend that deadline to Sunday evening, with millions of Americans in urgent need of help. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi received her first COVID vaccination today. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell given his first shot, too, part of efforts to ensure continuity of government.
Our senior congressional correspondent, Mary Bruce, joins us now. Mary, I feel a bit like a, a broken record the past few days. I bet you can anticipate before I even ask it what the question is. Where do negotiations stand tonight on this economic relief bill and what's holding up getting to a final deal? Well, Lindsay, I certainly can understand the feeling. Republican leader Mitch McConnell tonight says a deal is very close at hand. But of course, he has now been saying that for several days. And tonight, there is still no deal. Right now on Capitol Hill, lawmakers are mired in the minutia of this bill, even as millions of Americans are really suffering. And of course, just one week to go until Christmas. We do know that the bill will include $300 in weekly federal unemployment benefits and likely $600 direct payments to most Americans. There was a last ditch effort today to try and increase those checks, but that's failed. And now to complicate matters even more, lawmakers are insisting on tying this relief bill to government funding. Yes, that means that we are now headed for another partial government shutdown, the fourth of Donald Trump's presidency. Lawmakers right now are trying to postpone this by two days, giving themselves the weekend to finally pull off what they have failed to do now for more than six months, reach a deal to finally give Americans some relief. Lindsay. We'll be waiting and watching. Mary Bruce, our thanks to you. Thank you. And joining us now is Louisiana Republican Senator Bill Cassidy. Great to have you back on the show. Thanks so much for your time, Senator. Now, you, of course, are a part of the bipartisan group working on the stimulus compromise. Yesterday on the Senate floor, Mitch McConnell said, we are on the one yard line. What specific things are holding us up right now from getting to the touchdown? I'm told there are about eight or nine specific things, but I'm also told they're a little bit peripheral to that COVID relief that we know we need. So we could go into the minutia as your reporter st stated. I think it's more important to understand that they are peripheral, but they're also gonna be worked out. Congress recognizes the American people are hurting, and this is our package to the American people uh, to get us through until that vaccine is widely disseminated to get us through this kind of valley of death, if you will. And so do you think we're hours away or still days away? The fact that they're asking for, um, let me start over. We're probably hours away from a final deal, but it takes about 36 hours for it to finally be kind of go through the process. So if we're speaking of the final bill being passed, I'm guessing two days. On the other hand, let me emphasize, Congress recognizes the American people are hurting and we're gonna help the American people as much as possible, if you will, a ray of hope as that vaccine is disseminated. I understand one of the sticking points is a provision added by Senator Pat Toomey to take away powers from the Fed. Now, the Fed helped rescue the economy in the spring, of course. Democrats say that taking away powers from the Fed right now would hamper them if another crisis happens. Why is this change necessary right now when it seems like we're so close to a deal? A couple of things. Uh, I have to point out, Democrats complained about the provision when we put it in under President Trump. And now that there might be, a, there is going to be a new president, now they're complaining about the other way. I would argue if the Fed is going to have powers for an emergency, Congress can grant those powers. But Congress should not continue giving away authority to the executive branch, to the Fed, et cetera. That's not how our founding fathers set it up. They wanted Congress to actually deliberate. We showed we could deliberate quickly. We can get the Fed with the authority and the Fed with the money for whatever is needed. Uh, but I personally would rather power to reside where our founding fathers wanted it to be in Congress and not cede it to other agencies. Now, the latest framework seems to call for $600 stimulus checks. Your colleagues, Republican Josh Howley and Democratic Senator Bernie Sanders, wanted that number to be $1,200. Do you think that struggling Americans should get more than $600? If they are struggling Americans will get more than $600. There is uh, one, the $300 billion for the payroll protection plan. So that small business owner is gonna be able to stay in business and keep her people employed. There's a $300 a week supplement to unemployment checks. So the struggling Americans who are not going to have a job will be able to have that extra money, which is $1,200 a month on average. So that's a lot of dollars. For the landlord and the tenant, the tenant unable to pay, the landlord unable to collect rent, um, at least in the package we put together, there was housing assistance and there's also food assistance. So I would argue this package will give struggling Americans a lot of help. Now, you've congratulated President-elect Biden, who calls this stimulus effort a down payment, saying more spending will be needed to support the economy and rebuild after this downturn. Will you support additional spending on pandemic relief in the new Congress and work to deal with issues like state and local aid, as well as liability protections that won't be part of this bill? 
you know, a couple of things. Tell me what's going to go with the infection. If we're going to have 100 million doses of vaccine distributed by February, uh, or wherever, whenever Dr. Fauci said, the economy is going to recover. Now, the, the best stimulus check is a paycheck. So if the economy is recovering, if that unemployment rate goes down to where it was just before COVID hit us, um, we don't need another, we may not need another stimulus package. If not, then we might. So I'd rather judge by the facts on the ground as opposed to a hypothetical. And finally, you sit on the Senate Energy Committee. I know that you're well aware of the cyber attack. We learned today that it may be even worse than initially feared. How concerned are you and, and how concerned should we all be about foreign actors hacking into our nation's power grid and potentially being able to turn the lights off, so to speak? I think our power grid is actually secure. There's been a lot of effort. But to your broader point, we should be concerned about these foreign actors. You may recall under... Uh, uh, President Obama, the Office of Personnel Management was hacked. And the records, they were there for months apparently, or weeks, downloading, it was attributed to the Chinese, downloading all this information related to U.S. employees. Uh, that's a treasure trove of information. We have to recognize that foreign actors are coming after us. We have to beef up what we're doing to stop this. Uh, it is essential to our national security. Senator Cassidy, always good to have you on. Thanks so much. Thank you. And when we come back, just how deep did that massive cyber attack into critical U.S. government infrastructure go? What we're learning tonight. The massive drug bust targeting fraternities and major universities. But up next, remember this raid on the former Florida COVID data scientist? She's now speaking out as a major paper in that state is alleging the state hid deaths until after the election was over. What exactly is going on there? Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change, well, like every day. So what is it that you really need to know, want to know, to help you not just get through your day, but make the most of it? Feel smarter, feel better, feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA3, what you need to know. It's all about you. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. This is going to be so good. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. I've heard some demented and perverted stories, but this one, true shock. A kidnapping. Suddenly, masked men are in this house. An unthinkable act. If we're not going to get our money, we're going to take something. You're I thought, am I hearing things? And the one woman who risked her life to bring down her husband. I mean, it's my worst nightmare. Now, his stunning interview. Were you part of mutilating him? Obviously not. The 2020 event tonight on ABC. This place is all about magic and wonder. That's what it's all about. in the trenches. Prepare to have your little doggy mind blown. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. The Florida scientist whose home was raided last week, she says she will continue to speak truth to power. She's been challenging her state's coronavirus response, particularly the data that they put out concerning deaths. And now the South Florida newspaper Sun Centennial is questioning some of that state's recent numbers, too. Victor Kendo has more from Miami. 
showdown in Florida after newly released body cam video shows the moment police raided the home of former Florida Open data scientist Rebecca Jones. Now. Take a step back. Get to the door now. Open the door, man. Stop grabbing the doorknob. Open it now. Come outside. Who else is in the house, man? My two children and my husband. Where's your husband? Calm down. Calm down. You want the children now? Police, come down now. Sir, do not point that your gun at my Rebecca. children. Rebecca. Search warrant, come down the stairs, sir. Oh, got it is there children up there? A camera inside Jones's home shows police with guns pointed at the stairs. Search warrant, bring them down the stairs. My children. She alleged that my agents pointed guns at her children's head. You've seen my video, and you've seen the 11 seconds that she released. Nowhere in either one of those videos do you see an agent pointing a gun at a child's head. Law enforcement seized her electronics, executing a warrant that claims a computer at Jones's home was used to hack the Department of Health. What are they looking for? Oh, are you looking I'm, for a person? No, I'm going to. I'm, listen, I'm not going to intentionally leave you in the dark. Jones was fired in May for insubordination after allegedly altering COVID dashboard data without permission. She denies this and claims the state was doctoring the numbers as the governor was trying to reopen the state. We've seen a consistent decline in positivity rates. We've also seen a decline in new cases. After she was let go, she built her own dashboard to report Florida's COVID cases and deaths, painting a bleaker picture. She was then targeted for allegedly sending an unauthorized message to health department employees, something that she disputes. Governor DeSantis' office has repeatedly denied having prior knowledge of the raid. I knew there was an investigation into the breach. Uh, so, you know, this was an emergency system that was hacked into. I knew that they were set, they were going to hold somebody accountable. Um, I knew there was an IP address and there was a search warrant. Um, I didn't necessarily know how they were going to serve it or anything like that. But quite frankly, I think they did it by the book. Jones firing back at the governor this week in a scathing Miami Herald op-ed saying, quote, I will continue to speak truth to power to provide critical information on coronavirus and environmental issues and never allow a man so devoid of empathy and humanity silence my voice. Jones's case shed a spotlight on Florida's COVID tracking and a recent report by the Sun Sentinel suggests there may be more inconsistencies. According to the paper, data suggests that the state may have manipulated a backlog of unrecorded fatalities presenting, quote, more favorable death counts leading up to the election. When asked to comment about the Sentinel's findings, the Florida Department of Health said, quote, following the Florida House of Representatives investigation into COVID-19 deaths, the Florida State Surgeon General and the Florida Department of Health initiated a re-examination and review process to give COVID-19 death reporting a thorough vetting and ensure we were getting the most accurate data regarding the health impacts of the virus. Our thanks to Victor and still ahead here on Prime a week after their abduction an update about the story of those Nigerian boys who were captured by Boko Haram. Moderna and Pfizer have two vaccines that work almost identically. We'll break down these potentially life-saving treatments by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. The Army has soldiers, the Navy has sailors, and tonight we're learning the Space Force will call its service members guardians. on the ground and the Iraqi 18,000 tons Matata Ismail David over ground zero from Hurricane Michael you can see just home after home David thanks for you this was your view my favorite view thank you very much thank you I've heard some demented and perverted stories, but this one, true shock. A kidnapping. Suddenly, masked men are in this house. An unthinkable act. If we're not gonna get our money, we're gonna take something. You're I thought, am I hearing things? And the one woman who risked her life to bring down her husband. I mean, it's my worst nightmare. Now, his stunning interview. Were you part of mutilating him? Obviously not. The 2020 event tonight on ABC. We move up to the vehicle, he detonates the bomb, 
The heroes who stopped the killer, who held the city of Austin hostage for 19 days. It's a tripwire. All hands on deck. The clues, the Home Depot video, that truck, and the agent who connected the dots. It was exactly the vehicle that we were looking for. Inside the investigation. Vans made contact. The takedown of the bomber. Now streaming on Hulu. Yes, mornings may look different these days, but where you start your day, where you spend your mornings, where you get connected to everything that's happening. And face it, there's a whole lot happening in our world these days. Where you get all the breaking new information of the day to help you navigate through these times. That's why we're here. Good morning, sunshine. And making sure you start your day off with a smile and some sunshine. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Oh, how I love saying that. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. Welcome back, everybody, with Moderna's coronavirus vaccine set to become the second vaccine available here in the U.S. We wanted to see how it compares to the Pfizer vaccine, which, of course, rolled out this week. So let's take a look by the numbers. The FDA's advisory panel voted 20 to 0 on Thursday to recommend Moderna's vaccine for emergency use authorization. And once given the FDA green light, it would trigger the shipping of 5.9 million doses across the country. Like the Pfizer vaccine, Moderna's requires two doses, although Moderna's are taken four weeks apart while Pfizer's are taken three weeks apart. Moderna's vaccine would be administered to Americans 18 and older while Pfizer's was authorized for those 16 and older. One major difference comes to storage. Pfizer's requires specialized freezers with temperatures at negative 94 degrees Fahrenheit. Moderna's can be stored at negative four degrees. But the two mRNA vaccines have more similarities than differences and most importantly, both have shown to be up to 95% effective after the second dose in clinical trials. Still much more ahead here on Prime tonight. Saving a piece of your town's identity, the global struggle to save our favorite restaurants, or in this case, pubs, and how one town rallied together. And the controversy about saying doctor before Dr. Jill Biden continues, but tonight she's responding, and so is the president-elect. And we speak with the president of Microsoft about the growing alarm about that massive cyber hack. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Burning. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts.
Yes, mornings may look different these days, but where you start your day. Where you spend your mornings, where you get connected to everything that's happening. And face it, there's a whole lot happening in our world these days. Where you get all the breaking new information of the day to help you navigate through these times. That's why we're here. Good morning, sunshine. And making sure you start your day off with a smile and some sunshine. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Oh, how I love saying that. Powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Friday nights, 9 8 Central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime. 2020, Friday nights, 9 8 Central on ABC. Coronavirus cases still reaching new daily highs. The surge following the Thanksgiving travel period and gatherings. California is reporting record deaths and new infections. This is combat. This is combat. New York wants the epicenter, now trying to manage a slight uptick. Governor Andrew Cuomo says no hospital is at a point of reaching a danger level in the next three weeks. Health experts are urging all Americans to curb travel and large gatherings for the holidays. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, and Vice President Mike Mike Pence all rolling up their sleeves for the vaccine. It is truly a medical miracle and an inspiration to people across this country. Next week, President-elect Joe Biden will receive his shot. Nearly 350 students kidnapped from a boys' school in Nigeria have been set free. They were taken one week ago. The extremist group Boko Haram, which is affiliated with Al-Qaeda, claimed responsibility. It's unclear if any ransom was paid. Agents busted a drug trafficking ring operated by college fraternities in North Carolina. Prosecutors have charged 21 people they describe as hardened drug dealers. The amount of illegal narcotics being sold and used in this case was not only astonishing, it has also reflected a very serious public health crisis. They say the drug ring funneled $1.5 million in marijuana, cocaine, and other drugs onto campuses, including Duke University and UNC. There were sales going on inside these houses. Dealers set up inside these houses, poisoning fellow members of their fraternity, fueling a culture. And that's why I say today is about saving lives. The soon-to-be first lady finally speaking out about those questioning her title. Some people have recently taken upon themselves to question that title of yours. Do you have any reaction to those people? Yeah, that was such a surprise. The reaction coming after a contentious op-ed published in the Wall Street Journal saying she should drop doctor as a title since her degree is in education and not medicine. Dr. Jill Biden saying it was the tone that struck her. You know, he called me kiddo, and one of the things I'm most proud of is, uh, is my doctorate. I mean, I work so hard for it. The controversy taken to a new level by some, like Fox News host Tucker Carlson. Dr. Jill needs reading glasses. Either that or she's borderline illiterate. But others racing to Biden's defense, including her husband's new female vice president-elect, Kamala Harris. I was deeply disappointed that in 2020 that that kind of approach would be given any legitimacy. She worked hard. She raised her kids. She went to school. She went to night school. She got degrees. She earned everything she has. A Christmas tree, but with a twist. Key West, Florida is celebrating the holidays with a tree made up of festively decorated lobster traps. Dressed with twinkling lights and red ribbons, the unusual tree was built from about 45 traps. It's a focal point on the half-mile-long Harbor Walk that winds through the seaport. Each holiday season, the Harbor Walk is decorated with tens of thousands of lights. This year's celebration focuses on ways to enjoy seasonal traditions while preventing the spread of the coronavirus. Today, more details have emerged about that massive cyber attack impacting almost every part of our nation's infrastructure, from large private companies like Microsoft to the Department of Energy and even the Department of Treasury all hit. Lawmakers are now demanding answers as the FBI scrambles to assess the damage from the suspected Russia-led hack. Our Pierre Thomas brings us the latest from Washington. Tonight, the scope of the suspected Russian cyber attack ever expanding. 
some calling it the cyber warfare equivalent of Pearl Harbor, fearing it is perhaps the biggest attack on American infrastructure ever. This is really the modern equivalent of Russian bombers um, reportedly flying undetected over the entire country. Authorities suspect the potential Russian hack went undetected for six months. They are suspected of spying on emails and the communications of top government officials. And there's fear that the Russians might actually be able to control or manipulate some computer networks in an attack that's ongoing. This breach has to be a wake-up call for all of us. Microsoft, one of the world's largest software companies, in a report overnight saying the recent attackers used a technique that is put at risk the technology supply chain for the broader economy. And the list of federal agencies continues to grow. So far, the president has not said a word publicly about a hack in which the Russians are suspected. And his critics point to his reluctance to criticize the Kremlin. This was President Trump two years ago, casting doubt on U.S. intelligence that the Russians hacked the 2016 campaign. I have uh, President Putin. Uh, he just said it's not Russia. I will say this. I don't see any reason why it would be. Our thanks to Pierre. And for more on this far-reaching attack, we're joined now by Microsoft President and Chief Legal Officer Brad Smith. Thanks so much for joining us, Brad. Now, you published a blog post yesterday calling this a, quote, moment of reckoning and writing, this is not espionage as usual, even in the digital age. Instead, it represents an act of recklessness that created a serious technological vulnerability for the United States and the world. Just explain why this attack was on a different scale than what we've seen before and, and the unique challenge that this poses for the U.S. going forward? Well, it was both extraordinarily sophisticated and extremely broad. Because what the attacker did was put malware into the legitimate software of a network management company. And then when that company distributed updates, it literally went to 18,000 or so customers all around the world. So think of it as disrupting the technology supply chain and then it put at risk the security of all 18,000 of these organizations. And then the actor was able to pick and choose among these 18,000 which to then go in and disrupt further, which it did. And while it's early days of the investigation, we at Microsoft have already identified more than 40 organizations around the world, 80% of them in the United States, including a number of critical parts of the federal government. Now, sources have told ABC News that this breach went undetected for six months. Why were the hackers able to evade detection for that long? And when did Microsoft first identify a potential vulnerability around SolarWinds? Well, I think we identified it as we all focused uh, at the same time as everybody else. I think it was an attack of extraordinarily sophisticated software, uh, in effect. You know, it was a smart engineering move. Uh, it builds on what we saw in Ukraine three years ago in the NotPetya attack. Um, but uh, generally, the world has come together and said that espionage is espionage, but it shouldn't tamper with legitimate products this way. I think the lesson is, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to live with any comfort that certain governments around the world are going to follow the rules in this space. And to what extent did access through SolarWinds allow attackers to access Microsoft systems and those of Microsoft's clients? Well, the good news from our vantage point is that while we did detect a few instances where there was this software on our computers, our network is structured in such a way that things are very isolated, kept separate from each other. Uh, we have the kinds of sophisticated defenses in place that you would expect of a company like ours. And so we've seen no indication that any of our products or, or services were compromised. We've seen no indication uh, that any of our products or services were then used to try to attack someone else. We're still reviewing this, but that is the way it looks right now. And of course, Microsoft has been at the forefront of helping to track and stop bad actors in cyberspace, including in election protection efforts this year. Is this attack something that should have been detected sooner, or were the methods used too sophisticated to detect as they were happening? Well, we have more than 500 security engineers working this week with parts of the U.S. government, with others. Uh, I think the real lesson for us is we cannot afford to allow these kinds of attacks to go undetected in the future. So regardless of what we make of the past, 
This is that moment of reckoning. We need to apply the lessons learned. And certainly one of the lessons learned, in our view, is the need to take a new approach, if you will, to the sharing of threat intelligence data, not just across every part of the federal government, but with the private sector and technology companies that play such a key role. And that we need to build on that greater threat intelligence capability with stronger laws, more multilateral action between the U.S. and its allies to hold these kinds of foreign actors accountable with the kinds of consequences that will better advance peace and stability in the world. We thank you so much for your time, Brad Smith. Appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. And we have breaking news right now. The FDA has officially given the green light for the Moderna vaccine, issuing emergency use authorization, sending nearly 6 million doses of the vaccine now on their way to the arms of frontline health care workers, starting potentially as early as Sunday. A reminder that an FDA panel found that the Moderna vaccine was more than 94% effective at preventing symptomatic disease. And when we come back, how one town rallied together to save the business they love just in time for the holidays. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. What you're seeing right now, this is part of the eye wall. This procession of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. Let's do it right, guys. So this is the fourth week end of protest. <laughs> Watch NBC News on location for Facebook Watch. Whether a cat or a dog or a goat or a foal. Come on in, let me see. They all received care from a doctor named Paul. She looks so much better. The Incredible Dr. Paul. New season Saturday, January 2nd at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. Breaking news, context, analysis. With today's extraordinary news cycle. Now is the perfect time for ABC News Live. A streaming news game changer. The time is now for ABC News Live. Get it, streaming everywhere. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Hey everybody, first and foremost, I'd like to thank God. I know y'all have been sending y'all prayers out the last few weeks. And me and my parents are very grateful for the prayers that's been going out. To all doctor and medical staff at Tallahassee Memorial and UF Shands, I just want to say thank you for all the support y'all gave me, especially the lady that was in the gym at Florida State. To my Gator Nation and UF athletic family, I just want to thank you for all the prayers that y'all gave out to me. Go Gators. Go Gators. That was Keontae Johnson's message of thanks that he tweeted after his terrifying collapse on the basketball court just a few days ago. In his tweet, he wrote, write your own story. God said, my work here ain't done. The pandemic has forced the permanent closure of so many businesses that we enjoy and would typically frequent. Restaurants, of course, have been especially hard hit. But Maggie really brings us a story about how one community in the UK stepped in when they got word that the last pub in town was about to close. And they stood up to the notion that it was last call for alcohol. How they got help from others, including people right here in America. 
In a small town in England, a group of local villagers say they have until Christmas Day to save the last pub in town. All right, it's not actually a Hallmark Christmas movie, but it's really not that far off. Okay, let me introduce you to everyone. This is Claire. Claire's been spending pretty much all of her free time the past few months trying to figure out how the community can buy this pup. This is Susan. Her and the rest of her army of volunteers are figuring out how to raise money for the pup. And then there's this. This is the pub. Can't imagine the village without it. Beacon of hope and light. Yeah, it's not really the building, it's the people on the inside of it. That's what makes it. Fearless correspondent that I am, I ventured into the heart of the British countryside to discover what exactly is so special about a pub. Pubs? I mean, is, is it more than just the beer? at a pub? Much more than just the beer. It is the heart of the community. If, uh, if the, there's no pub in a village, the village dies a little bit. After decades of closures, the Whitehorse and Stonesfield is now the last pub in town. But when it had to close during lockdown, the owner decided it was time to sell. I mean, when you look at the Whitehorse and you see that for sale sign next to it, yeah. what does it do to you? No, it's, it's horrible. The owner tells us he has a buyer lined up and plans to sell to them at the start of the new year. The main concern was that it was going to be bought by somebody that wanted to develop it into a property. That's when Claire Brooks said she knew she had to do something. It did go very quickly from, could we do it? We should do it. Let's do it. So Claire and a few others decided the village will buy the pub themselves. The law gave them six months to do it, and they gave themselves a fundraising deadline of Christmas Day. Everybody went from naught to 100 miles an hour, just sort of overnight. Yeah. Armed with Christmas hats and cheer at a weekly Saturday morning bake sale. With cakes and chutney, that's the British way. <laughs> it's been fantastic. I can't, I mean, I just can't express it, to be honest. And it's all volunteer. And down the street at a car wash. We've just got a trail of cars coming through. But the big money and the main goal is to sell shares in the pub. We both uh, invested substantially in uh, keeping the dream alive. Stonesfield's struggles are not unique. This Local is, historian Douglas book. Rudlin yes, says 100 years ago, Stonesfield had seven pubs. But as local industries closed, so did the pubs. Now they're left fighting to buy the last one. Yeah, it's been very tough. If you bear in mind that the first 20 years of this century, we lost 14,000 pubs. So if you equate that down, that's two a day closing forever. Closing forever. Closing forever. Pubs are taken quite seriously in this country. But now, with so many isolating during the pandemic, they really are more important than ever. And already, nearly half of the villagers have bought into the White Horse. Did you have any idea how much work it was going to be? We had very little idea. <laughs> We'd been warned. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. So Claire turned to the White House, a community-run pub in neighboring Bladen, for help. And there it's everything you want from a cozy pub at Christmas time. Well, we've been open for just a few months now, but do you consider it a success? Yes. Absolutely. Yes, oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Just yeah. getting the doors open meant that we'd been a success. Yeah. I think you've only got to look around you to see how busy the pub is and yeah. how welcoming it is and how comfortable it is, I think, yeah. The White House is run like a business, but the shareholders are the locals. Everyone chipping in to not only make a dollar, but also to make the pub their own. But once I started painting these beams and, and feeling really part of it, feeling part of the fabric of the pub, you know, that, that, was, that, that made a big difference for me. And the model works. There are now more than 100 community-owned pubs in the UK. Claire and the rest of the committee were working around the clock, but they were struggling to hit the deadline. Then, a Christmas miracle, an article in the New York Times. It just went a little bit crazy. <laughs> Susan Rudland organizes crowdfunding for the White Horse and says money came pouring in from all over. They're a lot from America, but we've also got Canadians, Australians, you name it. It's fantastic. Why do you think Americans care about this pub? I just think it really struck a chord. I think it's a community effort. And I think in a year where COVID-19 has struck us all so badly, um, where communities come together, I, I can't explain it. It's just, it's beautiful. With money still coming in, 
Claire tells us they've raised enough to enter negotiations to buy the White Horse. The pub's owner declined our request for an interview, but Claire says she's confident they will have enough backing to present the owner with a real offer, and all in time for the Christmas deadline. It's hard to even express in words how important it is for us to, to, have, to have it. Maggie Ruley, ABC News, London. Real holiday spirit cheers to uniting to save that beloved pub. Our thanks to Maggie for that. And before we go tonight, our image of the day. Take a look at this artist dressed as clowns performing for the elderly at a nursing home in a bucket ladder outside their window. This was the scene in Prague spreading some much needed cheer during an otherwise dismal time. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great weekend.